Today I'm going to start a short series all about the Order of the Garter, England's senior order of chivalry. I'll explore the history of the order, primarily through the objects and artefacts created for it. In this first video I'm going to explore the circumstances of the order's foundation by King Edward III, and in follow-up videos I will look at the robes and insignia of the order, St George's Chapel and the stalls and stall plates, and some of the splendid historic insignia worn by the sovereigns of the order in the present day, including those worn by Charles III and Elizabeth II. The Order of the Garter was founded in the 1340s by King Edward III. The motive for its foundation, and even the formal date of its inception, is unclear. The official date of its foundation is generally given as 1348, but it may have existed in some form for a few years before that, and it did, as we will see, have a precursor. The year 1348 is simply the date that the royal wardrobe first issued robes and insignia to the first knights of the order, so we know it was operating by then. King Edward III, the founder, had been on the throne for 20 years when he founded the order. He had come to the English throne age 14, when his father, King Edward II, was overthrown in a coup d'etat, orchestrated by his mother, Queen Isabella of France, and the powerful Roger Mortimer, Earl of March. Edward II's political failure was to have favourites and to not involve the wider nobility in government. Age 14, the events of 1427 and his accession must have had a great effect on the young King Edward III. From the very beginning of his reign, Edward was aware of the need to have a loyal inner court of followers who are bound to him in some way, but also to ensure that they were wide and representative of the political elite as a whole. And a chivalric order that brought different factions within society together and bound them in loyalty was a means of creating stability. In the 1330s, Edward, then in his late teens and early 20s, and with youthful idealism, considered founding a very different order to that of the Garter. He was, like many of his age, fascinated with the stories of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. Arthur represented to the men of the Middle Ages the ideal model of kingship and knightly chivalry. In 1331, Edward and his wife, Queen Philippa of Hainault, visited Glastonbury Abbey in Somerset, considered by many at the time to be the mythical Isle of Avalon, and the monks presented to them the graves of Arthur and Guinevere, whose bones had been allegedly discovered there in 1278. In 1334, the 22-year-old king begins to formulate the idea of creating a new order of knights of the round table, with him and Queen Philippa in the roles of Arthur and Guinevere. In 1344, Edward holds a joust at Windsor in which he makes a promise to found a fraternity of the Round Table with 300 knights as members. He even began to construct an enormous circular building around 200 feet in diameter in the middle ward of Windsor Castle to accommodate the knights and this Round Table. In 2006, Channel 4's time team found the foundations of the building. Edward III wasn't the first or last English king with a King Arthur obsession. In 1290, his grandfather Edward I had created a representation of the Round Table at his palace in Winchester. At some point after 1344, Edward's plans begin to change, and the concept of a more intimate order, the Order of the Garter, is born. Most probably, a less ambitious scheme was projected as the context had changed. A lot of the king's energies and finances were now being poured into a campaign against the French. Edward III's wars in France were over claims to the French throne. Edward, through his mother Isabella, was the grandson of King Philip IV of France and nephew of three successive French kings. In 1328, when his uncle Charles IV of France dies, Edward was his closest living male relative. As anyone who knows Shakespeare's Henry V will recall, Edward III was barred from succession to the French throne by something called Salic Law, which prevented female line descendants from inheriting. The throne of France therefore went in 1328 to Philip VI, the son of the Duke of Valois and nephew of Philip IV. Edward thought his claim was stronger, and the war he began against his Valois cousins to press his dynastic claims would of course rumble on for nearly a hundred years. 
1346, Edward III is victorious in defeating the French at the Battle of Cressy. It was a humiliating defeat for the French army. And it's in the aftermath of this victory that King Edward III revises his plans for the Order of the Round Table and instead founds the smaller and more closely knit Order of the Garter. The symbol of the Order, and the object that gives its distinctive name, is an item of clothing, a garter, a tiny little belt of fabric with a buckle. It's a very odd symbol for a chivalric order indeed. The garter, which is worn around the left leg of a knight just below the knee, is emblazoned with a motto in Norman French, the language of the English court at the time of Edward III. Honi soit qui mali pense. It can be translated as evil he who thinks evil of it. There are a number of legends associated with the choice of this symbol for the order, but most of them are apocryphal and are not reliable. The most popular story is from the 1460s. It says that the then Countess of Salisbury, who was either Catherine Grandison or Joan of Kent, who would later become the king's own daughter-in-law, was dancing at the court in Calais after Calais had been captured in 1346 when her garter fell down. King Edward III is said to have picked it up off the floor and handed it back to her and allegedly uttered the words of the motto as he did so. Honi soit, qui mali pense. Sadly, the story doesn't hold water. In the 1460s, garters were an entirely female item of dress and it must have been rather embarrassing for a man to wear one. However, in the 1340s, when the order was founded, garters were an everyday item of male attire. They were worn around the leg just below the knee to keep up what were called split hose. This Norman French motto of the order, Honi soit, qui mali pense, evil he who thinks evil of it, almost certainly refers to Edward III's claim to the French throne, and perhaps his campaigns in France. Wearing a garter emblazoned with this motto was symbolic of loyalty to this particular cause. The order was dedicated to St George, to whom Edward III, like many soldiers, had a personal devotion. St George, who is said to have died in the early 4th century, was a career soldier, a Greek-speaking member of the Praetorian Guard under the Emperor Diocletian, who was martyred for his Christian faith, perhaps under the Emperor he served. For the medieval warrior, he was a model of Christian military service. The primary legend associated with him, and circulating widely in late medieval Europe, was the legend of St George and the Dragon, and it was popularised and perhaps embellished by the hagiographer Jacobus de Vorigine in his Golden Legend. According to this version, the events take place in a city called Silene in Libya, where the people of the city have been bothered for years by a dragon who's dwelling in a pond nearby who is spitting venom and poisoning everything around him. To placate him, the king of the city offers to the dragon tribute. And the dragon is initially happy with two sheep daily, but then he ups his demands to a man and a sheep, then in the end demanding the lives of the children of the city. The king agrees to the demands and the victims are chosen by lot, but eventually the lot falls on the daughter of the king. And the king offers all his gold and silver to the people if they choose another person and spare his daughter. But they say no, and the princess is led out to be eaten by the dragon. It's at that point that our hero St George just happens to be passing on his horse, and he sees what's going on and tries, despite her protests, to save the princess. St George makes the sign of the cross, charges the dragon and wounds him with his lance. He calls to the princess and asks her to throw him his girdle, which he places over the dragon's neck, and he and the princess lead the dragon back into the city. St George offers to kill the dragon if the terrified people convert to the Christian faith, which they all do, and St George beheads the dragon with his sword. Now St George, with his combination of military prowess, courage in the face of great adversity, and Christian piety became a hero for Christian warriors like King Edward III in the Middle Ages. The first 25 knights of the Order of the Garter were all prominent men, a combination of land-holding major magnates and knights involved in campaigns in France. Most were of the king's own generation. Well over half of the first knights had been present at Cressy, and it has been suggested, though it's not proven, that the order was founded to reward their action. 
King Edward's son, Edward the Black Prince of Wales, was also a founder knight. He, aged 16, had been at Cressy too, commanding one of the three divisions of the English army. Some of the first knights were of his generation too. The first Garter Knights were all men that the king could trust, or he felt politically expedient to bind in a form of allegiance to him. And the Order of the Garter was a way of binding them in loyalty to him and to one another through fraternal ties. Even today, the membership of the Order of the Garter is still fairly exclusive. The Sovereign, the Prince of Wales, and 24 Knights Companion. This is the core membership. To this has been added since supernumerary members, royal knights and ladies and stranger knights, and who are members of uh, foreign royal families. From the very foundation of the order, Windsor Castle has been its home, and that reflects just how personal a project the order was for Edward III. Windsor was particularly dear to Edward III. He was born there in 1312 and thought of it as home, if anywhere can be home, to uh, an itinerant medieval English king. Between 1350 and 1377, Edward spent around £51,000 on work at Windsor Castle, reconstructing it and creating its present shape. That's more than any other medieval king spent on a single building project. He constructed luxurious apartments in what is now the upper ward of the castle. The circular building uh, for the Knights of the Round Table was abandoned and Edward instead constructed a large hall, St George's Hall, in the 1360s. It was intended as a meeting and feasting hall for the knights and their armorial bearings were blazoned on the ceiling. Although the hall has been rebuilt since many times, the knights' armorial bearings can still be seen. Edward III also founded in the Lower Ward a Chantry College of Priests dedicated to St George, and they were sited within a chapel that had been built by his great-grandfather Henry III and dedicated to his royal forebear St Edward the Confessor. It was in this chapel that Edward III had been baptised. The role of the priests in this college was to pray for the souls of Edward and his ancestors, his immediate family and the Knights Companion of the Order of the Garter. The college still exists and still performs this duty. The earlier chapel was rededicated in honour of the Virgin Mary, St George the Martyr and St Edward the Confessor, but it soon became known as St George's Chapel. Rather than being given a place at a round table, the Knights of the Garter were instead given places within this structure. They were given stalls within the choir of the chapel near the high altar. Edward's chapel was mostly swept away, but when it was rebuilt in the 15th century, that's the subject of another video in this series, new stalls were created to accommodate the knights, and they occupy them to this day. Thanks for watching.